Hello and welcome to the next episode of With Developer Commentary. Uh, this week, I want to do something a little different. I've done FMV games for my first two, but uh, I love Die Hard Trilogy growing up, so I want to give this one a go. Had a pretty uh, interesting development uh, life. So it's really three games built into one, obviously Die Hard 1 through 3. We'll forget that the new movies even happen. It was created by Fox Interactive, who also did Independence Day for both the PlayStation and Saturn, among several other games. Maybe I'll do Independence Day next. I have that on Saturn. And Probe Entertainment. We will uh, get into them just shortly. So a brief loading scene um, where you, you'll not have the opportunity to select uh, which of the diehard games you want to start with. Uh, I'll be completely honest, the first game is definitely the best of the bunch here. I actually thought this, this opening was pretty neat the first time I saw it. So each one is uh, a completely different play style. Uh, this is with a vengeance. You'll be in a car driving around the whole time. Kind of feels like an add-on more than anything else. Uh, but like I said before, Die Hard 1 is by far the best of the bunch here. I apologize, I'm just kind of making changes to the video feed there uh, to see what displays best on my screen because I'm using a, a Frame Meister. So getting a, some of this hardware to scale correctly on a high-def TV is a bit of an issue sometimes. So uh, I found this for uh, $5 recently from my local game store, and I had to pick it up. I played tons of the PlayStation 1 version as a kid, so I thought, let me see how Saturn compares. And unfortunately, it does not uh, hold up very well. So there's that opening sequence again. Um, so according to Mean Machine Sega, the game was also announced for both the Genesis and the 32X, although neither of these platforms would ever see a release. Uh, Sega Retro Forums claims that Die Hard Trilogy was originally developed with the PlayStation in mind and the Saturn, which is what you're seeing here, and the PC versions became greenlit towards the end of the game's initial development. The Saturn is inferior in every way, and I noticed this as soon as I started playing. Uh, lower resolution, polygon count, and you'll really start to see the frame rate start to decrease later on. Transparencies are also uh, matrixed in many areas, as we saw with uh, games like Mega Man X4. So overall kind of makes for a not so um, great experience. So you see there the particles, and at least the transparencies for the explosives, are um, really oddly matrixed together. Which is weird because the Saturn can actually do transparency very, very well. Um, but it is um, one developer's um, issue that... Uh, actually, I'll get to that in a moment, like why they use transparency in such a way. But... Um, I mean, you see, you, the idea behind this is you're kind of running around and you want to essentially kill all the terrorists on the every stage, or every floor of the Nakatomi Plaza. Top right corner, we have 0-7 up there. That's telling you how many terrorists are remaining. Um, and also on certain stages, you'll have, really every stage, you'll have to save um, the hostages. And they're denoted by little blue marks on the map. So you get bonus, um, we'll say points and things, for saving the hostages. And later on in the game, you'll actually go to the roof where you'll have to get them escorted via helicopter and get them off, and that'll give you additional lives. So your health is actually that little um, police shield in the top left corner. Cool soundtrack too, it's kind of got like a little um, disco techno thing going on. So like I mentioned, this was created by Probe Entertainment, um, but uh, sadly the Probe co-founder, Fergus McGovern, died in February at age 50, so young guy. I mean, he must have been younger than I was when he was you know, creating all this. This came out in 90. Uh, six. Yeah, it came out in U.S. August of 96. I uh, picked it up right after that. So I mean, he must have been like 26, maybe 27 in making this, which is kind of wild because well, I would have struggled to make a lot of this uh, at that age, especially w when you consider that um, they didn't have tools and middleware like we have today. You're really writing your own engines and, and things from scratch. This also has a really neat little transparency effect when uh, it occludes a lot of the walls as you start to move around. And that was actually mentioned in um, Fox Interactive's uh, press release for this. So McGovern co-founded Probe Software in 1984 and quickly became known for porting well-known, lucrative arcade games for early PC platforms. Probe grew into a significant player as console gaming took hold in the 1990s, developing franchises such as OutRun, FIFA, and Mortal Kombat on a wide variety of platforms. So they had some of the biggest franchises of that era. In Mortal Kombat 2's home versions, which was fantastic, Probe became notorious for the frugality Easter egg, in which Raiden would turn into a big head mode, um, turn into a big head mode, f 
Fergus McGovern Sprite. Um, so you see, I just kind of want to get through some of these stages, so that's why I kind of skipped ahead here. That's the end of that stage would look like. Now I go up in the elevator to the next level. New soundtrack, different characters to kill. So Probe Entertainment, as it was renamed, uh, was sold to a claim, big publisher, uh, for forty million dollars in 1994, uh, 1995. It became known as Acclaim Studios. Um, Chel Cheltenham, until the entire company declared bankruptcy in 2004, unfortunately. Uh, in a 2008 profile by The Guardian, the government uh, was said to have been made a millionaire in the deal, and he later founded, founded the studio Hanjin. It was known for a line of plug-and-play joystick games based on classic arcade titles. So, we I mean, went from making great things like this to that. I mean, eh, whatever. Development is a uh, weird story. So, there are actually uh, several debug modes in this game, too. Um, there isn't one in Die Hard 1, but uh, there are for Die Hard 2 and 3. And I'll get into those in a little bit. Um, so, uh, Probe was also based out of the UK, and they had a great you know, uh, track record for more successful licensed properties. Um, so, the Die Hard with a Vengeance segment was actually developed first and intended to be a standalone release. Uh, the publisher Fox Interactive insisted the game should be more closely linked to that of the films, and I think they did a pretty good job of that. Um, leading Probe to develop their other two segments, right, which would be Die Hard 1 and 2. Um, they're all very, very different games, too, which, for its time, I think you're getting a lot of bang for your buck, right? Because you have this third-person shooter. We'll see it. Yeah, Die Hard um, 2, Die Harder, is an on-rail shooter, similar to, like, Pan's Dragoon. Um, then Die Hard 2 segment of the game is developed with polygonal enemies, or at least initially, um, but they were later replaced with digitized sprites. And you'd think that, you know, sprites, Sega Saturn, it could handle it very, very well, but this just completely choked on it. Um, even here, you see we're not getting great frame rate. I mean, it caps out at 30 frames a second, but it's not too often you're even getting um, something that good. So right here, I'm trying to kill off the last of the terrorists so that uh, I can start to trigger the um, elevator. So what happens is you kill all the terrorists in the stage, uh, an elevator will come that you can hop into, and you've got 30 seconds to get in the elevator, otherwise a bomb on said elevator explodes. So here we are transitioning. One terrorist left, and at random, the elevator will be selected. And I can't tell you how many times I died here. Also, it's not very clear that you can save the game. Uh, you can hit start at any point and save to the system. Um, but I saw other people complaining, hey, I can't save. And later on, I had to correct them and said, no, no, you can. It, it took me a while. So now we're going to load and go into the next Die Hard segment, Die Harder. 1990 film. Um, I really enjoyed this one, too. I thought it was pretty good. It takes place on an airplane, or at least in an airport, Dulles International Airport in Washington, D.C., for most of it. Here we go. So in terms of reception, um, the game was positively reviewed. So it received about a 9.4 from GameSpot, uh, 7.5 from IGN. And PlayStation Magazine gave it a 8, uh, 8 out of 10, um, calling it three good games the price of one. And really, it, it, it was. Um, it's glitchy, but a good value. Um, so as of October 2012, it holds an 86% ranking on game rankings. So solid. So here, you'll notice right away when this thing finishes loading that the performance just completely drops. And I do not remember it being this bad at all um, when I was younger. So here's a little demo mode. I kind of want to try some things out with the controller. I use the uh, the Knights um, analog controller for a lot of the games I play, but unfortunately it did not work in this instance. Um, so in Germany, the game was actually banned because of its extreme violence, especially being able to dive through uh, harmless people with blood spilling all over the windshield, which you'll see in um, Die Hard 3. Actually, I don't know if I got that, that clip. I don't know, we'll find it soon enough. I should have edited that audio, or that video segment out, but it is what it is. So right here, I'm just kind of watching the demo for a bit, but um, we're kind of walking through the scenario. So again, it's on rails. You don't really have control over where you're going. And see, like, the frame rate suddenly increases as soon as you get to the uh, hardest scores. So, moving on here, though. Um, Saturn vs. PlayStation. So the performance of the PS1 is superior in, like I mentioned before, every way. Um, there's a great blog post on um, how the Sega Saturn handled uh, 3D, but particularly transparency, um, from Matt Greer, which I've linked to in the post here, so I suggest take a look at this. 
So here we are outside of um, Dulles International Airport. Cops show up. And what's crazy is you can just wreak complete havoc on this game. I mean, you can just throw stuff everywhere. Uh, you have grenades and rockets, and you can shoot anything and everything. And uh, what's pretty neat is the environment will act accordingly to it. So you can blow up cars, as you see there. I, I didn't know how, how to reload at this point. Uh, it's slightly different from the PlayStation version. But you see when a lot of stuff comes on screen, it just kind of turns to crap. I mean, there's even physics uh, on some of the sprites, which I thought was pretty neat. So mercy shot. I guess I killed a guy who was on fire. But I mean, you see the frame rate just dropping already. Uh, you know, we're getting like 8, 10 frames a second here. The number of pickups along the way, you can get dual Berettas, you can get MP5s, more grenades. There are secret sections you can get to as well, which we'll see shortly. I'm, I'm not really sure what ever actually prompted me to get to these sections. Oh, don't want to kill a good guy. Oh, hit someone again. I don't know what it does when you actually hit those people, though. If it reduces your score or what. Also, really like the soundtrack for this game, too. I should probably look up who um, did that. You see, you can get tracer rounds so you can see where your bullets are going. Um, the soundtrack abruptly stopped. <laughs> I think because I actually hit pause there and I edited the, um, the controls. I had a really difficult time controlling this in the Saturn. Um, you can see there's like a bit of weight or momentum to uh, the, the reticule as we start moving around screen. And it took me a long time to get used to it. It just was not like how I remember it on the PlayStation. And here I am trying to tweak it because uh, this thing just did not want to play nice with me. So we get a decent frame right there. I'm being shot at. I don't even know where. He's kind of off the screen. <laughs> But see, you get a great frame right there. I guess it doesn't have to draw much. And now all of a sudden, it drops quickly. So now what's weird is you look at the bullets on the right-hand side, and they are transparent. It's kind of difficult for you to see here, but you can see through the bullets. Um, that's just me doing some editing. I want to uh, quickly get through this so we can take a look at some other games here, too. So Fox uh, had an uh, interesting press release for this. Um... So I managed to dig it up, and it said, The unique programming dissolves obstacles such as walls, posts, and corners in real time to ensure continuous action and an unobstructed view of your character, John McLean. Uh, in another Saturn breakthrough, two of its exclusive peripherals, the Stunner, that's its uh, gun, and the Arcade Racer can be used, uh, can be played on a single title for maximum a Die Hard experience. So you can use the um, steering wheel on Die Hard of the Vengeance. So it's rated M for gamers, uh, 17 plus. So it's set to invade Sega Saturn and Windows 95 CD-ROM on January 21st, 1997, an estimated shelf price of $54. So after every uh, game or match, you can um, use this to put yourself on the leaderboards. I always thought it was an interesting way of, um, of creating your name. I mean, it's a silly idea, but you get to see a lot of the sprites and characters that are in the screen. All right, and now we're at the final part of Die Hard, Die Hard with Vengeance. So this one is uh, interesting. They say that it's the, uh, yeah, I love the music for this game. They say that it's the um, the part that Probe Entertainment started with, but I think it's the least finished of all of them. Um, there's also a little debug mode in here too, um, which I have in the show notes, but um, you can show a debug screen, toggle the clock, which would have been huge. Um, or at least maybe it just draws the clock on and off. And then you can teleport over to the next bomb, which would be awesome because um, as you go on, this game gets brutally difficult. Foreshadowing for New York in the future. My hometown. So I do like they have like all these little um, pre-rendered opening sequences here. So I'm trying to figure out which button does what over here. Uh, the sharp left and sharp right are interesting because they quickly pivot you like 45 degrees in one direction or the other. Um, but you'll kind of need it with this. So, I mean, like overall, it looks pretty nice when you're coming in here. There's papers, you know, newspapers flying all over the place, people running around. There's uh, um, pigeons and things of that nature. Like, I thought this was awesome. And even a neat uh, you know, visual effect, some flair for the helicopter overhead. 
I always thought this music was great. It reminded me of something like, you know, out of Flavor Flav. With the yeah, boy! See, that's what I mean about the blood. It was banned in Germany largely because of that. Um, you can hit somebody and blood flies on the screen. So your goal here is essentially to hit those little um, targets that are all over the place. I guess... Uh, I forgot what his name was. The bad guy from Die Hard Trilogy uh, with the Vengeance. Um, has placed bombs throughout the city. But rather than run, like you do in the movie, you're driving a cab all over the place. Um, there's a great blog by a gentleman named Mick West. Um, it is called CowboyProgramming.com, where he also illustrates what it was like to program for the Saturn in the 90s. He's one of the co-founders of a Neversoft, who has created a bunch of hit games in that era. Um, and he goes into great detail about how this machine works. And we have has a, has a nice little um, development box on the side of one of those pictures where you can see, you know, what his process was like and what the dev kit looked like. Um, so here's some really in good information. The RAM on the Saturn um, that you could put code into is split into one megabyte chunks. One at address, and I can get a number, another, another address. The chunk at the first, or the second address, is used exclusively to hold the graphics for the main character. This is for Skull... Skull Warriors. Uh, the program code actually gets the first address, and it just talks about how he's like flipping memory back and forth um, to draw graphics on the screen. So I look at tools that we have today, like Unity and Real Engine, and how much easier it is to make games, where you're not having to deal with specific bits and parts of memory. Um, but to think that people actually had to do this that long ago, holy cow. And to create three completely different games in order to get it all to work, still kind of blows my mind. Um, the Assemblyer Games forums also has a bit more useful information. So, I uh, can't uh, you know, claim any of this is complete fact, though. They said, a lot of probes conversions were single processor efforts. At least, there were two that were definite. Alien Trilogy, which I may cover in the near future, is often mentioned as an example of a game using just one of Saturn's VDP, that's uh, Visual Display Processors. Plus, I seem to recall a former programmer with the same team confirming that Die Hard Trilogy was a similar one-chip game, which that may explain a lot of the poor performance. I mean, it looks fine here, but again, resolution kind of crippling. So, here, the second stage, you just start in a subway, but you're not in a you know, a, a police car chasing one of the trucks. This, I just have no idea what this had to do with anything else. I mean, I know there's a scene in the game where you're in a dump truck, um, but I'm just not sure what the cop car had to do with it or anything else. Uh, this uh, same developer, or person from the Assembler Games forums, also said, I've often suspected that Mortal Kombat 2 was directly ported from the Saturn, uh, to the Saturn from the 32X code but I'm not sure if it was another guilty title. One thing I do know about this one is that it only uses roughly 20 megabytes, which is terrible when you consider all leftover space that could have been allocated to the CD quality sound. That was at least for Mortal Kombat. So now we're getting towards the end here. This is the um, third stage in Die Hard with a Vengeance. You're going through Central Park. Oh, I, th I thought they did a pretty good job here of actually getting the look and feel of Central Park down. They do have roads and little walking paths throughout the city that you can kind of navigate around. So you're McLean and the Good Samaritan um, trying to chase after, not cop cars, but you'll see there's vehicles and bombs and things all over the place. Where this one really gets hard though is there's the lake you have to dodge throughout uh, parts of this game. So you can't really see it here, but uh, uh, towards the end you'll see me kind of crash into a lake. It pops up last second because the, uh, the draw distance of the Saturn was very poor, particularly for this game. Uh, so I, I mean, you can tell some of these are polygons, like the ground in particular, but most of the other things are sprites. So like the trees, sprites, um, the background there. It's pretty neat that you do have um, a, a, a bloom, or I should say a lens flare effect every time you turn a certain direction. I thought that was neat. It's one of those things that kind of goes a long way in game development. So that's what I have for you for Die Hard today. Hopefully you enjoyed this. And thank you for watching. If there's a game you'd like to see on the Game Dev Show, please feel free to send me a request at davevoils.com. Thank you, and I will see you on the next episode.